So we're here today to have a conversation that we should actually be having this week in Limerick, in Limerick City Art Gallery, where your show of 40 Years of Photography is currently on and has opened last week, albeit virtually. So as is the case with everything in this world of COVID right now, we're having to adapt and do it in a different way. So here we are today to talk about Very good. your work, uh, the book that goes with it and the tour and your history with Ireland in general. So uh, would you like to give a little bit of context for people about the actual project? Well, uh, I've, I've been photographing in Ireland since uh, around um, 79, something like that, because I went uh, and photographed the, the Pope's visit to Ireland in 79, because i have been there previously doing some teaching at the National College of Art and Design. And uh, I just thought the idea of the Pope coming to Ireland is going to be such a crazy event. Yeah. And that really kick-started my interest in photographing in Ireland. And then in 1980, uh, my wife was offered a job uh, to set up the speech therapy service in County Leitrim. Mm -hmm. And we thought, great, this is an amazing opportunity to go to Ireland for at least two years, which is what we did. And it's during that time that I shot the pictures for A Fair Day, uh, which came out in 1984. And this is, if you like, my last major project in black and white. Because mm -hmm. after that, I moved back to the UK and then changed to colour, in fact. Yeah. But we were living in the west of Ireland, mostly in uh, near to Boyle, in County Roscommon. And uh, I used that as a base to photograph in and around the west of Ireland. And it was an amazing time. So that's how it got started. But since then, I've been continuing to go back and I've watched Ireland grow and develop and change. You know, the change in this 40-year period is quite dramatic. Yeah. And last year, I decided to go back and photograph in Dublin to show the new scene of uh, the entrepreneurs, the, the whole the gentrification of Dublin, the, the fact that Dublin is housing these huge American corporations like mm -hmm. Google, Facebook, making it their European quarters because the corporation yeah. rate is so good. And that, is, if you like, is the um, final sort of chapter of this 40-year uh, saga. Well, that fits in nicely with some of the questions that I was going to ask you today, which uh, you've summarised quite well, some of the, the, the topics. And I suppose the first thing I was going to talk to you about was actually what took you to Ireland, which you've mentioned, but what you found that Ireland like at that stage, having come from firstly Surrey and then uh, the years of your university in Manchester, it must have been quite difficult and different well, to go to Ireland, was, but particularly that bit of Ireland. <clears throat> it was very different time. because for starters, we couldn't get a phone, you know, so uh, that was a very big sort of uh, drawback for, for me trying to be mm. a freelance photographer. So when someone had to phone us uh, or phone me, uh, you know, because Susie's working in different clinics in County Leitrim. So Monday was um, uh, Manor Hamilton, 17. Tuesday was Carrick on Shannon, 33. <laughs> Literally had this sort of note paper, all these different numbers for different days. And if someone wanted to get hold of me, they would have to phone Susie. And I would go out in the evening with my 75 P's in 5 P bits, <laughs> down to the phone, push them in, wait for the operator to press button B. And then I was able to speak to someone. So basically it meant that my... Um, freelance career just to sort of withered away. So the only thing that kept me going was doing a bit of teaching at NCAD because I had this connection to uh, Rob Smith, who was also a student at Manchester Polytechnic. Ah. And it was through him that I had that sort of teaching connection. Yes, because I was wondering when you came to Ireland, how your career had already been at that point in England. Had there been much of a, an establishment or were you still quite young and new and it wasn't a massive change to go to somewhere because I do remember when we didn't have telephones in Ireland <laughs> and that we had to go to the neighbour's house and mm -hmm. eventually we did get one but it was a shared line with the neighbours mm -hmm. which I'm sure wasn't great for privacy and my sister and I did always have little listen-ins when we weren't meant to but so I can remember what that was like and that would have been in the 70s as well but that kind of how established you were when you left to go to live in well, Ireland. Well previous to Ireland I was living in Hepton Bridge for five years and I guess I just started to get more established and mm -hmm. started to have a few shows around London but my, my, my career didn't really take off until I changed the colour with the last resort in the mid 80s and that's when I started showing abroad so mm -hmm. uh, previous to coming to Ireland the, the sort of access to big shows or anything that was fairly limited I had a show at the photographer's gallery with my bad weather project but apart from that, uh, and a few shows at the Impressions Gallery yeah. in Yorkshire, of course, who started, uh, kick-started, if you like, my photography career, together with uh, Daniel Meadows, who was also yeah. at Manchester Polytechnic with me. So up to that point in time, it's fairly limited. So mm -hmm. it was really in the 80s, later 80s, that things started to kick off for me. Yeah. Um, one of the things I was going to ask you, and you've touched on the colour bit already, so I'll, I'll ask you that now, is when you were in Ireland, was there any hint 
in the pictures that you were taking there or the pictures that you were seeing to take of that colour um, influence that you were getting from other people? Because I know you've mentioned before to me the people in America that you were influenced by, also black people like Peter Mitchell and Peter Fraser here. Um, was that coming through and what you were seeing in well, Ireland when uh, you were living there? In that time in Ireland, I did actually go and show some work in New York and it's there in particular that I stumbled across the likes of Joel Merritt, mm -hmm. William Eggleston, who'd had their shows in the late 70s in America. So I did sort of come across it whilst I was living in Ireland. And this uh, seeped in, and together with that, and um, remembering Peter Mitchell's show at the Impressions in 79, which is officially the first colour photography <laughs> show in a contemporary gallery. And uh, I think also seeing the postcards that I was collecting of people like the John Hind, uh, they were the things that sort of made me think about colour. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happened in 1982. Almost immediately I moved back from Ireland I uh, ended up near to New Brighton, got myself this medium format camera, new, just been uh, sort of introduced, if you like, mm -hmm. and uh, started shooting in colour. And then when you came back, because some of the pictures in the book, I mean, I'm not going to try to find them in the book, uh, but some of the pictures like the McDonald's opening and some of the early pictures of markets and the consumerism in the book in Ireland are clearly when you went back again after living there. How many times did you go back? at that oh. stage because I know in those pictures they look slightly like the new Brighton colour in the way that you <clears> did those. So yes basically I applied then the, the sort of techniques and language that I learned uh, by developing you know not only new Brighton but also the point of sale pictures mm -hmm. applied that to um, Ireland and uh, it's a project called A Week in the Life of Ireland and it's one of these projects where they get various photographers to come along take photographs and it's for that that I did the consumerism because um, Everyone else wanted to go to the west of Ireland. Everyone else wanted to sort of chase the old lifestyle yes. mm -hmm. of what Ireland was like, you know, donkeys, Aran Islands. Uh, and I said to the organisers, no one's going to be interested in doing um, supermarkets in Dublin. And of course they weren't. <laughs> so I had that whole subject to my entire myself. And it was just at the time that McDonald's had opened up. So it was mm -hmm. the first drive through McDonald's, which I photographed, and various uh, supermarkets like Super Quinn. So it was an ideal chance to sort of have an antidote to the traditional sort of rendition of Ireland that you see photographically. Yeah, no, that, that comes across. Did you um, find that when you were taking the original black and white pictures, the first ones, and you were doing those kind of series and the Cook Patricks, the Fair Day pictures, the horse seals, um, even the Morris Miners, did you see in your mind that you were taking the traditional Irish look, but you were doing it in a way that it wasn't ever going to be traditionally Ireland? Well, it was quite traditional, you know, because you know, there was this sort of club of Irish photographers that went around the different horse fairs, so I joined that circuit. Uh, but there was one project which you didn't mention just there, which is the bungalows, which is oh, really yeah. the first right. hint of the sort of Celtic tiger, you know, it's the seed of the Celtic tiger. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, because of course Ireland joined the EU, and uh, this is the thing that sort of really upped the wealth status of Ireland, that projects were being, um, you know, endorsed by the European Union, so money started to flow into the country. And one of the manifestations of that was this idea of people you know, upgrading their basic damp cottage, thatched, you know, not very nice to live in, uh, and building a modern bungalow. And you literally saw bungalows being built right next to the thatched cottage. So I did photograph these, this yeah. new ostentatious sort of look of how the bungalows were coming along. So apart from that, the, the things were very much more traditional Irish. Yeah, because I noticed in the essay in, your, in the recent book, uh, Fenton uh, O'Toole refers to that they're almost timeless, the black and white pictures, that they're, some of them could even be medieval if it wasn't for things <laughs> like plastic cups and plastic bags, they could be timeless. Yeah. Whereas when you, like you said, the bungalows are clearly a totally um, a different route. For some context, I remember as a child that you could get my parents talking about people getting grants to build mm -hmm. a new house to replace the existing one. And obviously it was like a big gossip thing in the area if somebody had got a grant to replace their mm -hmm. one. And they were always those very um, bright, charismatic bungalows that were such contrast to the Irish houses. Well, there's a book called Bungalow Bliss, mm -hmm. uh, which you could go along and buy at any newsagent. And uh, there there was like 120 designs. And you'd go through and you'd pick... Um, uh, you say to your builder, can you build me the one on page 77? <laughs> uh, and that's how it happened, really. So, you know, they're all pretty much bog standard uh, designs. Unless you wanted to spend a lot more money and build it, you know, bring in an architect. Uh, they, were, they were pretty standard and you could literally recognise them as you went round. So in terms of the returning over and over again to Ireland, because clearly you had your two years there, you moved to Merseyside and then you moved to Bristol. Uh, how often did you go back or did you go back 
when there were opportunities because I know for example you worked with Christine Redmond and the photo or the gallery of photography there as it was in its old form um, did you go back just for things that you were commissioned to do or asked to do or did you have a, a sense of oh, go back it's been three years I'll go back and see this area or uh, well I went on holiday and shot pictures while I was on holiday because that's what I do but then occasionally there'd be projects like the one I mentioned about the um, supermarkets in mm. Dublin uh, doing the commission with your good self at um, at uh, BX uh, so you know there would be occasionally projects and uh, uh, but most of the time I was just there anyway yeah. and I would just photograph you know randomly going around building up pictures obviously in color because all the time I went back it was in color and just generally if you look at the book you'll see this accumulation of pictures in that 40 year period so I would go back at least once a year every you know and, and often shoot on those trips you mentioned the Belfast um, experience, and I was going to talk to you about that uh, as well, because obviously I remember most of it. But you were, when you came to Belfast to do the Belfast Exposed Commission, which was on how Belfast portrayed itself as a tourist venue, if I remember. Yeah, how it had reinvented itself, yeah. Yeah, which is amazing. <clears throat> a very worthy subject. <laughs> very, very amusing as well. Um, but you have been before, because I remember you bringing previous work, so you must have been to Belfast in earlier days as well. Not so much. I have been once to the um, you know the July the 12th marches, but it, it wasn't a, a place I particularly had photographed a lot. So apart from that one in time of going there, just out of pure curiosity, yeah. I hadn't really photographed extensively. So it's great to have this opportunity to come and explore it more thoroughly. You know, and also at the same time, I was offered a, a professorship at... Belfast, so that was very convenient was and handy. brought me across, uh, you know, simultaneously. You're not tempted to go back and look at what the post-Brexit Northern Ireland might be like. There's so many people <laughs> have made so many projects on well, borders. Well, that's it. I know. The border has been very well exploited as, yeah. a, pro as a project, I have to say. So, yeah, it, it, in a sense, there's nothing much more one can bring to that. You know, when you see a, a subject that's been done very well, you just yeah. think, right, that's great. Let it, it's been done. Thank you very much. Enjoyed your contribution. <laughs> but there's so much else that isn't photographed. Well, no, that's, that's true, actually. And even when you've gone back to do the last uh, part of the series that you went to, was it 2019 you went back mm -hmm. to Dublin? If you had have gone to some of the other areas that you had lived in, so say to Boyle, you probably would have seen some changes, but it wouldn't have been as dramatic as those big city... Yeah, no, I think the, the real change was sort of almost Dublin-led because... Uh, you know, I was able to photograph things like the, the flat white, the cafes, uh, and of course the idea of a gay wedding, you know, which is quite a remarkable thing. Uh, you know, having a gay t-shirt, this would be unimaginable back in 1979, 1980, to actually think that uh, Ireland had a gay prime minister. Uh, and uh, of course the referendums on um, abortion, abortion, divorce, all these things have come through. Yeah. Uh, so, the, the ch you know, it, and also the demise of the church. I mean, this is a huge factor in it all. You know, the Catholic Church no longer dominates Ireland in terms of morality and social, you know, social being. So uh, that shift of change is, is really the thing that's driven Ireland forward, if you like. Did you, um, when you did this and you went back, do you feel, and I think I've asked you this a few times before, do you feel that this is a completed project now, that the 40 years <laughs> is neatly rolled up, there's no need to take more pictures from Ireland, or there's no need to develop it more. It, it wouldn't stop me taking more pictures in Ireland because, you know, uh, it, it, why not? Because I, I enjoy going to Ireland still and, and it's obviously going to continue to shift. But I think that 40-year period is an ideal time to start mm -hmm. and finish because the, the changes are so dramatic in that time. Well, that's it. I think the project feels very much like a very early stage of when Ireland was, like you said, very dominated by religion. It hadn't, the consumerism hadn't developed, the Celtic Tiger hadn't, risen, crashed and risen again and then you've now got um, a, a moment where you've completed it like you said with the flat white sort of symbolism. It reminds me a little bit of your Manchester project mm -hmm. so what you did for your original commission was with Salford wasn't it or the, some of the stuff? Yeah you well I, I was at college in Manchester so I was photographing in and around anyway and then of course I did some um, commissions for the documentary photography archive that was the Salford one in particular Yeah. so yes that was a good bedrock uh, and it gave me a chance again. Uh, I was invited by Manchester City Gallery to come back and photograph Manchester mm -hmm. all these years later. And of course, again, the change is dramatic, but not as dramatic as the change in Ireland. Yeah, well, that's that's what I saw. But when I was looking at your return to Manchester book, it had the same kind of mm -hmm. completed series feeling as well, that you'd started at a certain point in your career and you'd gone to a certain point. 
Um, do you feel that that's something you quite like? You like tying them up, or is that just? Uh, well, there's not many places I could do that because there's, there's, apart from the, in the UK, and I could still do it in England. There's not so many places where I photographed extensively in the seventies mm. or the or in black and white, yeah. and then gone back to later on in colour. So I mean, I could go back to Hebden Bridge and photograph there, but I often have thought about that uh, and decided it doesn't really appeal to me in the same way. I mean, of course, it's changed dramatically there mm. too, uh, but um, you know, I'm less intrigued by that than the, the prospect of maybe doing a more general thing about England and how that's changed, yeah. starting with the early black and white and then going on to the more recent colour. Do you feel yourself drawn back to your black and whites more now because you did have that huge early days mm -hmm. book was twenty nineteen? Mm -hmm. um, do you feel yourself wanting to revisit your earlier work? No, I, I think that's more? it. Now. Is that people like me who are just obsessed with it? I mean, I did the early works book, and that really did go over the black and white archive, and I think I've culled the best pictures from that shooting period. So that, that's it, really, in a sense. There's nothing yeah. much more to do. Um, I mean, I could go and find the you know more pictures in the archive, but they wouldn't be as good. Yeah. So, in a sense, the, completing that uh, early works project is, if you like, put, a, 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 put that project to bed and it's now sort of finished and done and I'm very happy to look back with great nostalgia to those black and white days. I can't believe how long ago it was and how the world's changed so much. But they are very popular because if you think this book has sold out its first print run mm -hmm. and it's meant to accompany a tour that only began last week, so the book had sold out before the tour even began. Well, that's nice, yeah. Well, it's got to be quite unusual, but also particularly in the world that we're in now where no one was going anywhere. So the book mm -hmm. is sold out. So there's a hunger for that kind of nostalgia in pictures, which we're probably going to see when the tour is actually in real life. Yeah. So it moves to Dublin in June, which we're hoping would be real. And then it goes to Roscommon in September, where you originally started the work. And then on to Boston, Belfast, and hopefully Parry Photo in 2022. So we're going to get a real feel for how much energy there is for revisiting all of these huge big projects. Well, I had a small show in Roscommon. Uh, various people came forward who found themselves in the photographs, so we always send them a copy. And um, when it is on the other day on Channel 4 on Sunday brunch, there's a shot of Linus Barr and there's a young kid in there and uh, his sister or his mother or someone got in touch, so we sent them a, a print as well. So it's amazing how, you know, this uh, these photographs from the 70s, Yeah. You know, it actually pop up again, all the early 80s mainly, how you know the people in them are still alive, so still going strong. So um, it's very flattering when people find themselves in these photographs and, and then write to us and we can send them a, a print. Well, I do remember that at New Brighton, the people actually coming in and you, us giving you their contacts and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, there's lots of other people who have clearly made work in Ireland over the years. Um, have any of them informed your thinking about Ireland or that you particularly enjoy their work about Ireland than talking north and south? Of well, I think when I moved there, there was this little sort of clique of Irish photographers like Tony Murray, Tony O'Shea, um, Vos Burke that we all knew. They're the people that would go around to the different horse fairs. So, you know, you know and in fact, both Tony and um, uh, Tony Murray and um, Tony O'Shea have both recently done books, which is yeah. great to see. Uh, but of course, from Ireland, you have um, you know, Gilles Perez, who's done one of the most amazing projects in post-war British history. Mm -hmm. uh, and that book is going to be coming out uh, within three months. I've seen an actual box of the books. It's now being printed, so it's coming out mm -hmm. soon. And of course, there's the wonderful Victor Sloan, who's one of my photographic heroes, uh, who did this remarkable work in the north of Ireland. And um, you know, we, we've acquired some of his prints for the collection here. Been lovely and, to see uh, them up. Yeah, so mm -hmm. sad thing, and that's all a whole male group, isn't it? That's a good point, actually. Yeah, so less female photographers. I think there's a new generation of, of women photographers, Jackie Nicholson, people like that, who are emerging. But, um, you know, it seems to still be a male-dominated photographic society. Is that right? It, it would be. Like, I know I come across a huge amount of women here, but when you mention it in Northern Ireland and in Ireland, there's less less so mm -hmm. although a lot of them are coming through the course in Worcester that you're on obviously. yeah well there's a few rising stars like Jill Quigley who I am a great oh, supporter yeah. of I heard Donegal yes heard, yeah. I mean we, we've acquired those for the foundation here because I think it's a remarkable set yeah that's it they are and I think they're in your show that's in the festival, Indeed, yeah. I think as well um, I have only a couple more questions to ask you actually mm -hmm. if there's anything that you feel that you want to say more about the book obviously feel free but um, mine are more to do with Ireland and itself and the culture that you experienced either when you lived there or since? 
Well, you, we would never forget how friendly the Irish are, you know. And, and we were there in a difficult period because it was during the hunger strike, so mm -hmm. we were aware of that because we were quite near the, the border. Uh, but generally speaking, people were very friendly, very open, very forward. And, uh, you know, the crack that you have in Ireland is always there to be had. So um, I've had some great evenings in Irish bars, meeting people, just going to hear some music, just mm -hmm. involving yourself in the crack. And the other thing I think we should say is that uh, the, the first book I did was by Fintan O'Toole, and the text for the second and last book is also by Fintan. He's someone we've, we've stayed in touch with. And he's now, you know, when I first met him, he was working for it in Dublin uh, on a sort of casual basis. And now he's sort of, if you like, the leading commentator uh, on Ireland, uh, you know, with his uh, position at the Irish Times and, of course, his amazing insights into the first the financial disaster in Ireland and mm -hmm. then, of course, Brexit and its repercussions for Ireland. So it's absolutely fantastic that he did a brilliant text. It's actually one uh, of the for, best essays I've read in a long time. In for book. both books, in fact. So yeah. um, I think we must mention his contribution is absolutely crucial. And he's uh, doing an in-conversation with you in real life in Dublin. He is indeed, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that there. very much. Well, Martin, I have um, had enjoyed our conversation and thank you for thank taking you. time. It would be so much nice if we were doing it with your images behind us, but it is lovely to have all of your books behind us instead and our current books. Put that behind us instead. <laughs> well, hang on, no, we should have this one, sorry. <laughs> um, so thank you. Thank you, Tracy, for your, you know, getting this off the ground because um, you know, this is an idea that uh, occurred to us and then it, uh, you, know, you actually made it happen. So I appreciate your huge contribution to that process. As always, it's been lovely.